Okay, so question seven, we'll pick up part two of homework 7-3 with question seven. And this one's definitely one of the most algebraically intensive questions. Um, we definitely, we have to set up several equations and then use a system of equations to solve this. And again, a lot of opportunities to make maybe a little calculation error. So just be careful as you go. I will go ahead and write the, uh, the answer that I got. And again, I, I haven't had a chance yet to double check this, but I do believe this is the right answer. Um, that the velocity is 2.39 meters per second. So if you've got that, you're confident with that, feel free to jump ahead in the video. Um, but if you didn't get that, maybe follow through and see if, if you made a little calculation error along the way. Um, but anyway, the approach to this problem is obviously the most important part. right? Algebra aside, we need to know how to set this problem up. So we've got the two blocks like we've seen many times before, but the, the pulley is not massless and it's not frictionless. So now the torque and the, uh, the rotation of the pulley actually do come into play, right? But we still approach this one the way we normally would. So I'm going to call this, this mass over here mass 1 and this mass over here 2. And so just like usual, the, the easiest approach on this is going to be to set up a system of equations, right? Starting with the, uh, the net force on each of those masses. So the net force on block 1 would be the force of gravity, right? Minus what I'll call tension 1. And obviously the, the key concept that pops into play is the tension is not uniform throughout the disk, right? If it was, the uh, pulley wouldn't be able to rotate, right? If the same force was exerted on both sides, the pulley would not spin, and therefore this system would not be moving. So I'll call this T1 on the uh, right-hand side. So I've got that set up. So this is mass 1 times the acceleration. The force of gravity is obviously mass 1 times gravity, and then minus T1. So if I look at this equation, right, I know mass 1 and I know gravity. So the only two variables I have, I don't know the tangential acceleration and I don't know T1. So then obviously I get stuck with that equation, so I set up a second equation. So my second equation, my net force for this block, well this block is going to go up, right? So my net force on that would come from T2 minus the force of gravity on that second block. And so again, I get mass 2 times the acceleration equals T2 minus mass 2 times gravity. So once again, I look at this equation and I have two variables, two unknowns. I have the acceleration which again, key concept, it is going to be the same acceleration for both blocks. This one can only fall as fast as this one rises, right? So they are going to be the same acceleration. However, unfortunately, the tensions are not the same. So if I look at these two equations, unlike in the past where we didn't have to worry about the mass of the pulley, because the mass of the pulley is significant, these two equations are not enough to get me there, right? And so that's where torque comes into play. Right? In order to set up an equation that's going to relate all of these together, in order to set up an equation that's going to help us relate this to this, we need to use the torque acting on the uh, pulley. So setting up the net torque equation, much like I did the net force for these, I'm going to set up the net torque on the pulley. Well, I know that the net torque would equal the moment of inertia of the pulley times the, uh, times the acceleration of the pulley. Right? That's what the torque would be. They do tell me that this is a uniform solid disk, and so the moment of inertia for what it's worth would be one half mr squared, so that will come into play shortly. And then now we need to think about how do we find this net torque right on the pulley. Well, the net torque is going to come from two different factors, right? On one hand, we're going to have the tension one, which is pulling perpendicular to the pulley down here. Now, on the other hand, we're going to have tension two, which is pulling down on the left-hand side, again, perpendicular to the pulley. Well, if we think about this, as the system moves, the pulley's got to rotate clockwise in this case, right? It's got to rotate clockwise. So what that tells us is the torque produced by tension 1, and again the torque produced, not just tension 1, but that torque produced by tension 1, has to be greater than the torque produced by tension 2, right? So the torque produced by tension 1 minus the torque produced by tension 2 would equal my moment of inertia, which I'm going to go ahead and plug in as 1 half mr squared, and then times alpha. So again, if I break this up, well, how do I calculate torque? Well, in general, torque is force times radius. Right? So the torque produced by tension 1 would be T1 times radius. The torque produced by tension 2 would be T2 times radius. And then on the right-hand side, I still have 1 half mr squared. The reason that I did go ahead and break this up, I actually can clean this equation up a little bit more, right? And I have to be careful about doing this because, again, I don't want us to, to make this an overgeneralization. But because in this case, I have a radius on each side of the equation, right? Every term has a radius in it. I can go ahead and cancel out that radius. Now again, I have to be careful because I do need to make sure I originally represented the torque, which I did, but now I'm going to simplify one of the R's out. 
So I get, I get T1 minus T2 equals not quite the moment of inertia, right? A little bit less than the moment of inertia. Um, but I get the 1 half MR and then alpha. So I've got this equation. So I've almost got exactly what I want, right? I've got T1 and T2, which were good. The only problem is now I had to have alpha instead of the linear acceleration that was A. So the final concept that comes into play here, the final step for us is, how does A relate to alpha? Well, the A is going to be the tangential acceleration of the disk, right? This acceleration downward is going to be the same as how fast the disk is accelerating tangent, or how fast the uh, tension is accelerating tangent to the disk, right? So my tangential acceleration relates to my angular by simply the radius times alpha. So probably the easiest substitution then is if I take each of these uh, tangential accelerations and replace them with r times alpha. So I'm going to go ahead and write, rewrite each of these equations down beneath it. So now it's m1 times r alpha equals m1g minus t. And then my second equation being uh, m2 times r alpha equals t2 minus m2g. Right, so now I've got these three equations, and all I have to do, even though it is a little bit of a mess, all I have to do is bring these three together into the same, uh, into the same equation. Right? I have to find a way to, to eliminate or substitute all of these together. So probably the easiest thing to do at this point is to go ahead and solve each of the uh, force equations for tension. Right? So when I solve for tension 1, I would add the tension 1 over and then subtract this. I'd get M1G minus M1R alpha. And then when I solve for tension 2, I would get just adding that over. So M2R alpha plus M2G. Right, so this is tension 1, this is tension 2, I said that backwards, tension 1, tension 2, and then just substitute those values in. So at this point, it really does just become all about the algebra. Right? I'm going to go ahead and start to plug the numbers in as I plug these in as well. So I know mass 1 is 5.7 times 9.8, minus, again, plugging this in for tension 1, so minus 5.7 times the radius, which they gave me of 0.12 meters, and then times the alpha, which I don't know. Here, when I plug in tension 2, I do need to make sure that negative is going to distribute to both parts of that equation. So I'm just going to make both, both of them negative. So my second mass is 3. So 3 times again the radius of 0.12, and then times alpha. And then again a negative 3 times 9.8. And then on the right-hand side of my equation, I've got 1 half the mass of the pulley, which they gave me of 10.3 kilograms. And then the radius, again, 0.12. And then once again, I have my alpha. So again, the key at this point, the only unknown that we have is alpha. So it is just a matter of adding these two quantities over, right? Add both of these over to the, the right-hand side, and then solve from there. So what we end up getting is 5.7 times 9.8 minus this, minus 3 times 9.8. And then once I find the difference between those two, um, so that ends up being, if I do this minus that, I end up getting about 26.5 on the left-hand side. And then once I add these two quantities over to the right-hand side, I believe I get about 1.662 alpha, rounding that up to a few spots there. So then my angular acceleration, my angular alpha here, is 15.94 radians per second squared. That's my angular acceleration. So then the question becomes, okay, how does the angular acceleration help me find out its speed after a certain distance? Well, again, angular acceleration can help me find the linear acceleration, right? So once I know the angular acceleration is, is alpha equals 15.94, my tangential acceleration would just be r times alpha. So my tangent acceleration, my linear acceleration, if you will, would just be 0 0.12 times 15.94, which then ends up being about 1.91 meters per second squared. And once I have the linear acceleration, once I have that tangential acceleration, I've got my acceleration, I've got my initial velocity because the system started at rest of zero, and then I'm looking for my final velocity, and I know that it's fallen a distance of 1.5 meters. So I've got all three of these measurements to work with, and I just need to find my final velocity. So at this point, hopefully it's just some easy kinematics, right? Um, using v squared equals v sub zero squared plus 2a delta x, and then solving for the velocity, and that's where I got my 2.39 meters per second. And obviously, depending on where you have or have not rounded things off, it may vary a little bit. But it shouldn't vary very, very much. Uh, no pun intended there, right? But it should not vary by more than maybe a couple hundredths. If you're off by more than that, double check and make sure maybe you didn't make a uh, calculation error along the way. Uh, but anyway, 
Question seven, like I said, conceptually, I, I do want to make sure everybody gets comfortable with this type of question, but algebraically, I know that it is tough to solve. There is, there's a lot of opportunities. Um, there are a lot of opportunities to make an error along the way. Uh, but anyway, hopefully this question is not too bad. If you do have any further questions on it, or if I messed up, if you think I messed up on it, um, let me know what I did or, or what you possibly did to, uh, to get the right answer. But anyway, hopefully that one wasn't too bad. Okay, so question eight is really exactly like one of the ones we did in the note. And the notes, I believe it was section maybe seven two. Um, but I did throw this in here because the bottom line is just got to practice it, right? Use calculus to derive the moment of inertia for a uniform disk of radius r and mass m if it's rotated about an axis passing through the center. So the good news is we actually know what our final answer should be. We know my final answer should be one half m r squared, right? That's where I should end up. So let's just go through the process of again how we got there. This is also in the notes, so if you feel like you get lost as I do this, feel free to consult the notes as well. Um, but anyway, I'll go through this again if you if you need further explanation. So the moment of inertia is always the integral from whatever parameters of r squared to dm. So the reason I'm going from z to r is because for a uniform disk, right, if I'm pivoting in about the middle, I'm going to start in the middle and I'm going to work my way outward. So I'm going to go from zero and then up to a maximum distance of the full radius, right? So the biggest question, as it always is when we try to do this, because it's always following the same approach, the biggest question is, what does dm represent? Well, again, the idea here, if we're finding the moment of inertia for this disk, what we're doing is we're really taking these small concentric circles. We're taking these small concentric rings right around the center. So dm represents what is the mass per ring. So what is the mass per ring? Well, if I want to figure out the mass per ring, I really need to know the mass per area and then multiply that by the area per ring, right? The area of the ring itself. Okay, so that's going to be my goal. Well, finding the mass per area isn't too bad. I know the total mass of the disk is m, and I know the total area of the disk, right? The total area would just be the area of that circle, so pi r squared. Notice I am going to use a capital R squared here because the total area of this disk is going to be based on the entire radius, right? So I'm using a capital R here. Finding the area per ring is obviously a little bit trickier, but if I'm trying to find that shaded area, if I'm trying to find that amount of area per ring, again, imagine that I take that and I slice that and I unroll it, right? Well, that ring would essentially be a rectangle or a parallelogram. And if I want to find the area of that rectangle or parallelogram, it would be simply the circumference, which would be the length, so it'd be 2 pi r, and notice I'm using a lowercase r because the circumference would depend on which ring I'm taking, right? would depend on how small or big that ring is. And then the change in the, the height here would be the width, right? It'd be the change in width. So that would be my, my dr, my change in So then the area would just be 2 pi r times dr. So again, the area per ring, I'm taking my mass per area of the whole thing times the area per ring, which would be 2 pi r dr, right? 2 pi r times dr. So then what that tells me is this whole quantity right here, this whole thing represents dm. So I'm going to substitute that up there for dm. This represents how much mass per individual ring. So now I get the moment of inertia equals from 0 to r, the integral of r squared times m over pi r squared, and then 2 pi r dr. Now I can obviously cancel out the pi's. That's no big deal, right? I can do that. And then I can pull out any constants. And so that's where we have to be very careful about which r's represent the entire radius and which ones represent only the specific uh, position at which we're at, right? So the capital R actually represents whole radius, so I can pull that out front. So my moment of inertia, I can pull the m, I can pull the 2, and I can pull the r squared out front. So 2m over r squared is out front, so then I have the integral from 0 to r of, I've got r squared and another r, so I have r to the third dr. So then when I integrate this, this ends up being 1 fourth r to the fourth, and again, I have to plug in my parameters, right? I have to plug in r and 0 and then I have my 2m over r squared out front, right? So I still have to, for this part, plug in my parameters. Well, obviously, when I plug in 0, that makes the whole function 0, so I really just have to plug in r, right? So I get 2m over r squared times 1 fourth, capital R to the fourth, and then at this point, if I just do a little bit of cleanup, well, the 2 and the 4 can simplify down to 1 over 2. The r to the fourth and the, excuse me, this should have been an r squared out front, the r to the fourth and the r squared, can simplify down to r squared. So I end up with mr squared over 2 
or better yet, one half mr squared.